Everyone have a lot of midterms? Yeah? Okay, okay, we'll just get started then. Okay, cool. Hello, everyone. Uh, we'll get started. <laughs> so a quick uh, note on grades. Um, by the way, uh, make sure you uh, uh, check in with your attendance and the quiz. Um, apparently, it looks like about 60 students are going to fail the class. Uh, and when we wait like 40% of our grade on attendance, like, and, like there's this few many people here, uh, that's kind of to be expected. But um, if you have any questions about grading um, or like your own like quizzes, whatever, uh, feel free to email decal at blockchain.berkeley.edu. Yeah, decal at blockchain.berkeley.edu. Um, yeah, okay, so today we're going to be covering um, last semester's favorite lecture, except in two lectures, um, because like we felt there was a lot of material that we could go over. Um, and in general, people seem to be interested in this stuff. So uh, Nutter is going to be starting off with 
uh, the regulation part, um, basically like how are cryptocurrencies regulated, and I'm going to be talking about like, okay, anonymization, privacy, going the other direction. And then in the next lecture, we're going to be going into a lot of the more uh, technical proto uh, protocols and techniques uh, and really like cool stuff uh, for anonymization. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Adir Akhtar, if you remember me. Uh, so I'll be going over the cryptocurrency regulation and the regulatory perspectives that governments have from the state level to global level. Now, governments, as we know, like to regulate. That's the whole reason that cryptocurrencies were developed in the first place, to avoid these regulations. So there is a certain protocol called anti-money laundering. Every company has to make sure that their customers are not practicing money laundering, uh, which is particularly much uh, more difficult to track through cryptocurrencies. As we know, cryptocurrencies are uh, anonymous. They are difficult to tr identify who the person is spending those, crypto spending those coins or those cryptocurrencies uh, because you only have a random number to identify them. So anti-money laundering is defined as the prevention of undetected large flows of money from crossing borders or moving between the underground and legitimate economies. Right? Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies were designed for this. They were designed to be beyond borders and to be undetected. So the question is, who enforces this in the first place? Well, in the U.S., we have FinCEN, which is a division of the Treasury that enforces uh, anti-money laundering protocols and ensures that certain companies, such as um, Coinbase and Kraken, are following these anti-money laundering laws. For example, uh, recently, the IRS asked Coinbase to give up the identities of Coinbase members because they were suspecting that certain Coinbase members were using cryptocurrencies to uh, launder money. Know your customer is another protocol that needs to be followed. Know your customer is as the name implies. One needs to know their customer and be able to authenticate, authenticate who they are. For example, someone shouldn't be able to walk in to your company and say that they're John Smith from 123 Main Street and be able to use certain funds or be able to engage in certain activities without verifying who they are. For example, when you're dealing with Coinbase, you have to provide your passport, a social security number, and other sensitive information in order to participate with them. Because if you don't provide this information, they can't make sure that they identify who you are. You have to evaluate the risk of your client, meaning that if your client is doing something that could potentially be illicit, you have to make sure that you don't engage in further interaction with them or further, further business with them. So in, if clients are engaging in certain activities, these activities need to be reported to, for example, the IRS or other regulating entities. And companies also need to watch out for anomalous, anomalous behavior, essentially keeping track of where certain funds are going or the activity that certain people have that are using uh, their business. So if they notice anything, again, they need to make sure that they give this information to a regulating body. The money transmitter license is what authenticates, authenticates a person or entity to be able to do the following. Uh, provide money transfer services or payment instruments. So this is important in cryptocurrencies because if you don't have this license, um, then it's very then you're obviously going to be called out and you're going to be shut down. And in order to obtain this license, you have to go through a very thorough process, which is called, uh, well, it's called by some as a financial colonoscopy because they want to check everything as deep down as they can to make sure that you're not engaging in any illicit or malicious or otherwise irresponsible behavior. And a few of the things you have to go through, uh, fingerprints of the particular people involved, uh, audits of financial statements, uh, records of lawsuits that have taken place within the last 15 years against you or anyone that is a, in a high position in this company that wants to start, uh, that wants to obtain a money transmitter license. All right, so there's all these regulations that the government is putting on businesses in order to make sure that they're not misusing anything or trying to evade government laws, like uh, anti-money laws, anti, or anti-money laundering laws. So with a bit license that was issued by the New York State Department of Financial Services, you can do the following five things legally. You can receive virtual currency, for transmission or retransmission. You can hold virtual currency for others. You can buy and sell it as a business. You can exchange services as a customer business. Or you can control, administer, or issue your own virtual currency. 
So in order to do any of these five things, you need to have a license that allows you to do such so that you make sure that you're in compliance with AML or KYC. So as for regulatory perspectives, obviously every country and every region has its own particular take on cryptocurrencies. So this might be old news to some, and it probably is to a lot of people, because news in the cryptocurrency world travels very fast. Uh, if you're not familiar with the ETF decision around Bitcoin already, so an ETF is defined as a marketable security that tracks an index, a commodity, bonds, or a basket of assets like an index fund, essentially allowing people to invest in these in these commodities or items like stocks without owning the item itself. So some background on why we're discussing ETF. The Winklevoss twins, who if you've seen the social network, are the same twins who tried to sue Mark Zuckerberg uh, because they claimed he stole their idea for Facebook, requested to launch an, a Bitcoin ETF in late 2013. And recently, as of late March of this year, a decision was finally uh, made, and that was that Bitcoin is still too unregulated and too unstable to be tracked like an ETF, because it would lead to the investors not being sure that, uh, you know, not being confident in the security and in the stability of their cryptocurrency. So they also claim that a lot of the exchanges that deal with Bitcoin are outside of the US, a lot of the influence is outside of the US. And because of that, you know, because of these quote unquote poorly capitalized and unregulated exchanges, for example, uh, in China, that Bitcoin's prices and Bitcoin's stability is not easy to ascertain. And because of that, uh, Bitcoin is not eligible for ETFs. Now the question is whether or not this rejection was entirely bad, right? Now we see that Bitcoin was designed to be beyond government control. It was designed to be beyond borders. And for that very reason, the United States has said that Bitcoin is unregulated, that Bitcoin is beyond control of any single government. So in a way, they're actually reaffirming that Bitcoin is doing exactly what it was intended to do, which is to evade governments and to be beyond any central control. So are there any questions on um, anything so far? Yeah. Uh, so you said like the wallets have to provide an you mean like uh, exchanging low like yeah. asking yeah exactly yeah. right so there's no way to track if you want to buy like 10 million bitcoin from your friend or something yeah. mm -hmm. all right so let's take a look at some perspectives so a lot of u.s states uh just by default have said that cryptocurrencies aren't recognized as legal currency and that blockchain information is not recognized as valid information. But recently, in Arizona, in fact, they signed a bill that contained the following information, that a signature that is secured through blockchain technology is considered to be in an electronic form and to be an electronic signature. And the same applies to a record or contract that is considered to be electronic records. This is very important because it says that the information of blockchain is actually valid and legal to be used in court of law, given that there is sufficient evidence that the information and the signatures have been you know, validly verified and procured. Uh, and this essentially allows for the blockchain to be used to store information that is legally binding. Right? This is concept that code is law and that the blockchain is like permanent, that it's the truth. So this bill that was passed by Arizona essentially affirms that like, a government is affirming that a blockchain can hold information that is truly representative of real world events. And Vermont passed a similar bill that said that um, timestamps on blocks and that the information contained within blocks are both valid for use in a court of law. So these are these bo both of these states are saying that if information is stored on the blockchain via a company, via a group of peers, then it is permanent, that it is valid in a court of law to be used as evidence and as, and as factually true. So around the world, we see that there are a few regions, particularly Europe, that are warming up to Bitcoin. For example, London said that it wanted to give a more positive embrace towards Bitcoin. It said that it wanted to be the financial hub of cryptocurrencies and that Bitcoin was the next, next big thing. And by inviting you know, Bitcoin use to Europe and to London in particular, it would be able to you know, continue that trend of being what they call themselves the hub of finance for the last few hundred, several hundred years. So they don't want to have unregulated use, but they want to say that the regulation should not stop the use and that uh, given proper precautions and proper uh, control, Bitcoin should be able to thrive 
in London. Uh, Switzerland allowed for the development of a new type of bank called crypto banks. And while you might not think that that's necessarily something impressive, like imagine if you can walk into a physical institution and give someone US dollars and get Bitcoin. And this physical institution is you know, verified by uh, government agencies to be valid, to be safe and secure. So, you know, this development shows that like cryptocurrencies are gaining a lot of respect and legitimacy even in the eyes of governments. And something that's also really cool is that Japan recently recognized Bitcoin as a legal currency, causing, this, causing the prices to increase by around 2%. Like this government is saying that this decentralized currency that's not backed by anything, that's not owned by anything, is now a legitimate currency. Right? They're saying that you can recognize Bitcoin as a legitimate currency even though there's no, no one to back it, no assets backing it. It's entirely based on people believing that it has value. And now Japan, the government itself, is saying, yes, this currency is legitimate and deserves to be recognized. However, not all governments, unfortunately, think uh, have a good perspective about Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in general. For example, in Bangladesh, uh, if you're found using cryptocurrencies, you could be sentenced up to 12 years in prison. Uh, you had a question? Yeah, what's the implication of being recognized as a legal currency in Japan? Does it mean that it's a legal tender, or does it just mean that it's not prosecuted for using it? It means that it's legal tender. So there are some that might say that uh, like you can't be prosecuted, but they might not recognize it as a legitimate currency either. Uh, but Japan is saying that it is a legitimate currency and can be used as legal tender. And uh, so it's a step above from neutral to like acceptance. So could you, for example, pay your taxes in Bitcoin? I suppose because Japan has defined it as a legal tender, it would be possible. So, for ex sorry. Uh, were there any other questions? Okay. All right. uh, for example, in Russia, they have also prohibited the use of cryptocurrencies, and their reasoning was that a strong digital currency is going to weaken the national currency. So currently the Russian ruble has been down for around the past three years, and while it's gained some, while it's recovered a, a little bit, the fact that Bitcoin exists is still weakening the value of the Russian ruble. And the reason for this is quite obvious. If you have something that, trans, that, trans, uh, that transcends boundaries and can be used with anyone around the world, why would you want the Russian ruble instead? which doesn't necessarily have the, the manpower or the value to back it. So Russia wants to restrain the use of Bitcoin in order to incentivize people to use the Russian ruble and to you know, own more of it. And in Ecuador, Ecuador is actually trying to produce its own cryptocurrency, or its own, not necessarily cryptocurrency, but its own electronic currency. And the use of Bitcoin would obviously deter the use of Ecuador's electronic currency. You know, if there's competition, it's harder for this less legitimate, smaller electronic currency to thrive when you have this decentralized, you know, battle-tested cryptocurrency that anyone can use. And, yeah, uh, yeah, does anyone have any questions on government regulations? Yes. Yeah, Sweden. So apparently it's a big market, uh, waste products or other scrap metals, and they're saying that you can't use cryptocurrencies to purchase these items specifically. I don't know exactly why it's the case, but this apparently this big market, they don't want people using cryptocurrencies for it, they'd rather they use national currency. Right, any other questions? All right. And now it's Max's turn to talk about anonymity. All right, so uh, Nadir gave a good... Uh, Intro to the regulation. Now I'm going to be talking about all the ways that we're going to break it. All right, let's go. Okay, so uh, we we kind of know that blockchains aren't anonymous by default because essentially what you're doing is you're taking some you know database where uh, in a central location you can have access control and guard access to it, um, and you're distributing it to now where everyone has a copy of this database and can now read their own copy at will. So all the data in the uh, blockchain is public by default. So uh, in addition to that, uh, blockchains aren't anonymous, they're pseudonymous, meaning uh, we use pseudonyms on the blockchain. So a pseudonym is basically any identity uh, that's not like our real identity. So for example, this could be your Twitter, Twitter handle, your uh, like GitHub uh, handle, your Reddit handle, etc. Um, and the key thing is that these pseudonyms may or may not be linked to our real identity. And this concept of linking is uh, very important in this context of, or in the context of anonymity. 
um, because this is basically if someone is able to identify you just from knowing your pseudonym, right? Um, so when you want to de-anonymize someone, that's what you're trying to do. So these two concepts uh, have or two, two terms for the same concept. So uh, Bitcoin best practice also has a rough degree like uh, of a little bit of anonymity where every time you receive money, you're supposed to use a new pseudonym. So this is like, you, I want to generate a new Bitcoin address every time I receive funds. And this is analogous to if every time I went, wanted to comment on Reddit, I made a new Reddit account. So you can imagine that there's a little bit of anonymity there. It's hard to like correlate these together. But uh, in techniques um, that we're going to be discussing in the rest of this lecture, you'll see that basic analysis basically renders this uh, completely ineffective. And then also a quick note on Ethereum. Since uh, Ethereum is an account-based ledger uh, and you're supposed to hold your funds all at like this one address, it's even harder to have anonymity because instead of spending from UTXOs where all, these, all your transactions might be separate from each other, uh, it's, everything is, is tied together in your Ethereum account. Uh, furthermore, anonymity isn't absolute. It's not like, yes, I'm anonymous, or no, I'm not anonymous. There is a degree or, of anonymity, sometimes referred to as a lev level of anonymity, where uh, it's basically a measure of how hard it is to um, link your pseudonym with your real-world identity. And if you have this high degree of anonymity, then you have achieved privacy. But, you know, Nadir was uh, talking a lot about okay, uh, we have all this regulation to make sure people are doing uh, legal things and not doing illegal things. Why do we need privacy? Like, are there any like, legitimate use cases for like, having privacy and anonymity on a blockchain system? So in these next few slides, I'm going to develop a few uh, scenarios in a uh, blockchain-based future where everything is built on a blockchain, like the world is run on blockchain, and uh, we'll, we'll see what problems we'll run into. Uh, if we have, if we don't have privacy or anonymity, so Bob's Burgers. Say you go to Walgreens and you make a purchase, and your uh, cashier can then look you up on blockchain info using the Bitcoin that you just sent them, and they see 20 purchases a month to this address, uh, publicly labeled Bob's Burgers, but everyone knows it's actually the world's biggest porn site. So uh, they they now know, you know, your habits. Uh, a more extreme example is if you go to the same cashier and then they find out that one of you is secretly Satoshi Nakamoto. So now uh, they know exactly how much to extort you for, like just by like kidnapping a family member or something, like you and your billions of dollars of Bitcoin. Another example is uh, just getting paid back by a friend. Like you're at a restaurant and they refuse to split the bill. So you're like, ah, oh, it's okay, I got it. Uh, I'll pay the bill and then your friend is going to pay you their portion of the bill. And then later on, when you go to Bob's Burgers to try to make a purchase with your friend's Bitcoin, uh, they don't accept your Bitcoin. Uh, that's because they, they did some analysis and then they see, wow, your Bitcoin is associated, is associated with like illegal things. It's dirty money. We don't want to accept your money. And now this touches on an important concept of currencies called fungibility, which basically means that Every unit and every subunit of a currency need to be uh, equal. Like they need to be equally spendable. You can't just be able to spend this unit of Bitcoin, but not your uh, friend's unit of Bitcoin for Bob's Burgers. Um, and you need this because otherwise the property of a functioning currency uh, breaks down. Now a little more like uh, less personal example. Say like we're remember we're in this blockchain-based future where we can theoretically run an entire business on a blockchain where all your input input costs are paid on the blockchain. Um, so in this example, you you founded a hot new startup called BitBlockBasedCoinPay.cash, and you want to keep up to date with your competitor. So you're like, okay, I'm gonna go there and buy one of their products. But then you realize, oh shoot, I didn't use my personal like Bitcoin card or whatever. I used the company Bitcoin. And now, now they are able to trace your company. They, they know exactly how much revenue your company has, who your, who your company's customers are, uh, all, the transaction, uh, all the transactions you made in the past. And like, they might be able to infer from your transactions your like, you know, secret business strategy. So uh, this is a huge competitive disadvantage. 
Um, the conclusion from all of this is that um, with this lack of anonymity, um, basically anyone you've ever transacted with is going to have access to your entire you know, uh, transaction history going all the way back to the past and forever forward into the future. It's like, it's like everyone you ever touch uh, forever has like copies and reports of your bank statement every month. Um, that's not something we want. So let's, let's see if we can uh, uh, resolve this. Uh, also, a quick note on anonymity and ethics. So yes, uh, these anonymous cryptocurrencies can be used for uh, money laundering uh, and online drug purchases, for example. Uh, but the partial solution, as uh, Nadir uh, talked about in like K KYC AML regulation, is that you just want to regulate the edges of the system. So this is kind of like, uh, like cr cryptocurrency can stay as its own black box, but whenever it touches into you know government spheres or legal spheres, then you want to regulate that part. And that's like when uh, you go to an exchange and you're able to basically trade around cryptocurrencies with, without revealing any personal information. All you need is generally like an email address and that's fine. Uh, but as soon as you want to trade between cryptocurrencies and like US dollars, then they start asking for like your driver's license, your passport, your social security number, really personal information. Um, the other thing is that it's hard to implement morality at a, at a technological level because it's, um, you know, it's pretty much a hu very human concept. Uh, from a technological standpoint, these moral and immoral use cases look exactly the same. So this is why, for example, in uh, Augur, we need to introduce some human judgment, like oracles that are going to say, okay, this is ethical or this is unethical. Um, so it's, it's hard to, like, you know, implement this in a cryptographic scheme, right? Um, and then finally, like, we, we just want to take this technology with this approach that, okay, do the positive benefits to society outweigh the costs? And we can take some inspiration from uh, Tor, which was actually created by the U.S. government, as you may know. Um, it makes it really difficult for the government to bust, you know, like, uh, drug rings, like, money laundering, whatever. Um, but in the end, they decided that they would keep Tor around because it enables uh, these reporters and re uh, oppressive regimes around the world to still have a say and still have uh, free speech. And they're like, okay, we're just going to find other ways to, uh, to do law enforcement on the dark webs. Okay, so now I'm going to cover uh, de-anonymization, which is like all the ways that you can... Uh, you know, de-anonymize, like, say, the Bitcoin network. Uh, we always, remember, we always study Bitcoin because it's kind of just the simplest example, easiest to understand. You should be thinking about how can we generalize this to other blockchain systems as well. Okay, so uh, transaction graph analysis is basically where you, you know, you have this giant blockchain of data. You want to just inspect this history to see if you can infer any information beyond just like which pseudonym has what money. And remember that your goal is to de-anonymize, right? Uh, you want to link this uh, real-world identity with this pseudonym on the blockchain. Now, I've talked about how in Bitcoin best practice, we want to generate a new pseudonym every time that we uh, receive money. Um, so any person may have a whole number of pseudonyms, right? So you need to associate all of these addresses to the same entity, and that's called clustering. Now there's uh, two main heuristics that you can use to uh, do this clustering. The first is if you have merging of uh, unspent transaction outputs. So for example, if there is a coffee that you want to buy for 0.05 as the standard amount, and then you only have two UTXOs in your wallet, like one UTXO of 0.02 and another of 0.03, uh, it's then what you would do to like, pay that coffee shop is you'd combine these two uh, outputs into one transaction uh, with the output of that transaction going to the coffee shop. And this is a fairly reasonable assumption that these two inputs are owned by the same person because rarely do people on the network conduct uh, joint payments. Like usually like you only need to uh, merge to like kind of collect all the dust uh, in your wallets from all the little amounts of UTXOs sitting around. Uh, the other heuristic that you can use is change addresses. So uh, this is the, the even more standard example where you have a one Bitcoin UTXO and you want to buy the coffee worth 0.05. Well, to get changed back to yourself and not spend the full Bitcoin, 
you need to make another uh, output that like sends the Bitcoin back to yourself. And now you can now you can assume that okay, the output that I was spending from the UTXO is owned by the same person as the change address, right? Um, but to identify this change address, uh, you just need to see okay. Generally, uh, in all of these implementations of uh, Bitcoin clients and wallets, you've never seen these change addresses before on the blockchain. So um, I'm, that's how I know which of these two outputs is the change address, and I'm going to associate that with the UTXO that it was spending from. Um, so using these two heuristics together, you can kind of like uh, slowly cluster uh, and merge all the entities, um, all the addresses together by entity in the Bitcoin network. Any questions? All right, okay. So now we've formed these clusters where we have, okay, we have groups of pseudonyms together. We know they're all associated to the same entity. Um, now we need to associate that cluster of pseudonyms with like their real world identity. Um, and so in the case of services, there's a few ways that you can uh, go about doing this. So say I wanted to identify uh, Coinbase on the network. Uh, all, I would, all I'd have to do is uh, I would go to Coinbase, I just make a bunch of deposits, make some withdrawals, like do some other transaction activity, and then I'll just watch those uh, addresses and transactions on the blockchain and wait until I have one of those clustering heuristics come up and it can be merged into the uh, rest of uh, addresses that are associated together with uh, Coinbase. Now you've seen, okay, this group of addresses is Coinbase. Uh, other things you can do is you can just infer by looking at the activity on the network. So this picture right here is a uh, visualization of the Bitcoin transaction graph in 2013 and uh, where all the addresses have been clustered together already. And you can see back in 2013, uh, Mt. Gox was something like 10% of the total volume of Bitcoin transactions, like a ridiculous amount. So you can see here's this giant dot of like giant volume for Mt. Gox. Uh, on the other hand, there was another service called uh, Satoshi Dice, which basically allowed you to do uh, provably fair gambling on the Bitcoin blockchain. And so people would be spending a lot, like a, a large volume of small, uh, or a large number of small volume transactions to Satoshi Dice. So that's why you can identify Satoshi Dice as this little dot down here with a large number of uh, outgoing rays. Now, uh, let's say you want to uh, identify individuals as well. Say, like, you want to identify me. Um, there's several te te techniques where you can identify me. You can be like, hey, Max, I want to send you 69 Bitcoin. And I'm like, yeah, sure. Here's my address. And then I've given you my address. Now you've associated my real world identity with my uh, blockchain pseudonym. Um, other things, uh, 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 other things. Other ways that you can uh, identify me is if I'm just careless. So for example, if uh, I was stupid and put in the second lecture of this decal that like, oh, hey, here's my Bitcoin address, send me some Bitcoin. Uh, now you know, okay, that's my Bitcoin address, right? Uh, and then lastly, you can also use a service provider. Um, there's actually companies that specialize in doing this uh, de-anonymization work uh, using a combination of all the techniques that we've uh, talked about so far. Uh, there was a company, uh, called, there is a company called Skyree, which was previously known as Coinalytics, that basically does this and they market their product as like, you know, compliance, uh, AML, and they're making Bitcoin not fungible. All right, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's their goal. Yeah, so the question is like how how would a how would this company identify like me as an individual? Um, it, it all depends like on the data that they have. So so they're probably <laughs> scraping the Bitcoin forums, scraping like uh, everywhere online for like Bitcoin addresses and seeing if they can tie that. Um, like just collecting massive data sets uh, is the main thing, uh, real world data. Yeah, um, I don't know how good they are at it, but yeah. Can you explain the Gomic? 
Oh, the comic. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I was okay. I was working at Change Tip and Coin Telegraph. Apparently, they were running out of faces for all of their like uh, article stock photos. So I sent them this like picture of me going like this, and then uh, they like. I guess they photoshopped out my hand. <laughs> and then th this was on some like article on like Australian banks like experimenting with like cryptocurrencies. So yeah, I was I was my face was on a Cointelegraph article. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, taint analysis. Um. So taint analysis is basically this idea that okay uh, of the funds. Um, at a particular address, how much of these funds can be traced back to this other address, right? And the general idea is you want to have, uh, you want to tag these addresses as tainted. Uh, tainted uh, may or may not have a good or bad uh, connotation. Um, and then you want to propagate this taint. So you assign those addresses 100% taint, and then you're going to propagate this taint across the network weighted by the amount of Bitcoin that has flowed there and uh, by the amount of taint that each node currently has. So to kind of like run you through this example, uh, up here if we start with this uh, very tainted node um, and we keep on uh, going to the right to just sending our Bitcoin to new addresses to new addresses, you can see that it maintains a 100% taint. And this foils the naive strategy of mixing where like, okay, you know, they've associated my pseudonym with my real world identity. It's okay. I, it's Bitcoin. I'm just going to generate a new pseudonym and move my funds there. Uh, this is this is taint analysis is why uh, that doesn't work, and that's actually what uh, foiled uh, Ross Ulbricht's defense, um, like that that he obtained all his Bitcoin legitimately because uh, in court he was like, oh, like here, here's all my money. Like I got this through like legal means, and then they just like got the Silk Road addresses, propagated the taint from there, and they saw that it was like you know, 100% taint from Silk Road. Like, not very smart. <laughs> um, you can also see that, like, as we go down this uh, diagram and we mix in more and more clean funds, the, the taint gets lower and lower until, like, this pale yellow dot that's, like, at 11% taint. That's probably clean enough to be spendable at Bob's Burgers. But uh, as soon as you want to... Uh, as soon as you mix in dirty money again, then you have, with a high amount, then you have, again, a high amount of taint that you can't use. Okay, any questions here? This, this, this slide is, uh, I think this is kind of uh, one of the unique parts of this course, because um, when I was researching taint analysis, like, I could, I could find, like, zero, like, absolutely zero documentation online on how the math actually works. And um, I've been able to specify this math only because uh, of a friend who worked at Coinbase and who built Coinbase's taint analysis tools for when you withdraw from their site. So Coinbase is watching you. Keep that in mind. Yeah. Is it actually used? I mean, out of all time for? I mean, could I get a bit suspected? Uh, I don't think it's used regularly. I mean, usually if you're buying from an exchange, you're not going to get like tainted bitcoins. Like, but it, it's it's usually just tainted if like, um, for example, it's a known like uh, drag website or like a fake ID site, uh, and then you like send bitcoins there, and you're like, okay, you know, like Coinbase will actually shut you down if you like send money directly from your Coinbase account to like the fake ID site or whatever. So, yeah. Is there a way to check like how a company or person is fund how much of it is tainted? Um, like it sounds like it's like. Yeah, so the question is like, is there a way to check um, how much your funds are tainted? Um, so I, I should, I should uh, keep in, I should uh, elaborate that taint is defined by the data, like the, the specific addresses that you tag as tainted. So it depends on your data set. So it, you might be wanting to do taint analysis for like, oh, I just want to see like um, how much of my funds uh, came from Colin over here. Like, because uh, we, we do a lot of payments together. Um, it doesn't have to be specifically like for illegal activities. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this is a, a screenshot of the taint analysis tool on blockchain.info. And this is 
they, they intend for you to use this like uh, as a measure of like how good your uh, mixing was. So like you you would run your coins through a mixer and then you have like some uh, new freshly generated address that your coins arrived at. Now you put that address into their taint analysis tool and then if you're able to find the original address that like you had sent your coins from on this list of like you know likely sources, then that means okay the mix wasn't good enough. It uh, did not break the link between your old pseudonym and your new pseudonym. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to cover uh, anonymity through uh, mixing. Um, this is we're going to cover kind of the the basic parts and uh, dive into the technical ones, more technical ones, uh, next lecture. So what is mixing? Um, it's kind of analogous to uh, the the layering step of traditional money laundering where okay in traditional money laundering we have like a bunch of shell companies and we're just going to deposit our funds into these shell companies and write them off as like uh, i don't know like uh, investments like uh, input costs etc um, and over time these you're going to have these shell companies send funds all between each other in this really complex uh, trail to and its intention is to obfuscate the path that the money actually went through uh, and then finally, like presumably, you've like had you have clean funds, and now you're able to spend these like funds for whatever you want. And so mixing is just like that middle step where we're gonna send our uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum, whatever, through a bunch of different pseudonyms in the hopes that like okay, we're eventually gonna have like uh, clean funds. And generally, you also want to do this with like well, I mean, always you will want to do this with other people. So everyone is mixing their funds together. So like you may or, you probably won't have the original money that you started out with. Okay, so to allow you guys to reason through this uh, formally and with like uh, an adversarial uh, framework in mind, uh, we'll, we'll define a few things. So um, first define an anonymity set. So this is the set of pseudonyms between which you can't uh, distinguish a particular entity that you're trying to de-anonymize from their counterparts. So for example, if I have a mix of 30 people uh, and they all mix their funds together, the, then the anonymity set is 30. Um, and the goal of mixing is we want to make this anonymity set as large as possible. And the easy way to accomplish this is to just you know repeatedly mix, just do multiple rounds of mixing. If you go under the assumption that like, okay, uh, of these n people in my group, if they all also did like another round of mixing and then another round of mixing, then your anonymity set increases exponentially, you know, n, n squared, n cubed. Um, but there's often real world constraints on how big your anonymity set can be. Like, uh, usually there's not that many people in the network who want to mix their funds. Uh, there, th and furthermore, a lot of the times the people that you're going to mix their funds with are uh, doing it for illegal reasons anyway. So you might uh, mix your funds and then come out with dirty money that uh, you can't spend anymore. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the other thing is that the larger this anonymity set is, the harder it is to, you know, de-anonymize or relink your pseudonym to your real identity. Uh, like, this should be intuitive. But we want to note that it's hard for, we want it to be hard for anyone to link these identities together. So even in your mixing group, like, uh, of like the 30 people that you mix with, you don't even want them to know who you are and associate your pseudonym because otherwise you can like de-anonymize the network by participating in a bunch of mixes. Um, other properties that you want for your mixing technique or your uh, protocol or whatever is you want it to be trustless. Uh, you don't want counterparty risk. In other words, you just don't want to lose your money, right? That should be fairly obvious. And then you also want it to be plausibly deniable. Um, this means that you don't uh, want it to be really obvious from your transaction history that you were, in fact, mixing. Because if someone has you know, a grudge against you and they want to like, pin you down for doing something illegal, uh, they can, like, uh, then when they sue you in court, like, this lack of plausible deniability can actually count as evidence against you. Because although like, the court can't see where your funds went, they see that they were doing something suspicious like, oh, like, look, look at this giant, like, transaction where it's obvious that they're, like, mixing. Um, that's not something you want either. 
Okay, so now we're going to cover the first two types of mixers. Centralized mixers, all coin exchange mixing, we'll pick up next lecture. Okay, so centralized mixers, it's uh, fairly intuitive, uh, as you might imagine. Um, basically, you have some service, often on the dark web, uh, that operates like a slush fund of bitcoins. And then what you do is you send your bitcoin uh, to that service, sometimes with a fee, and then uh, wait some amount of time, and then they're going to send uh, bitcoins to your new address. Um, the reason why we want them to wait a bit of time is that otherwise you could do uh, timing attacks where like you see money going into a mix and then other money leaving a mix so you're like hmm I wonder if those two are, are owned by the same person and if you know the software uh, operates that way that would be like basically defeat the whole point of doing this. Um, so yeah can yeah. Uh, the question is is the time you have to wait for that kind of randomized um, Generally, yeah. I mean, you want it to be, yeah. yeah. Right. So, can we imagine some problems with this centralized mix? Yeah. You have to trust the person mixing it. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Can we think of anything else? Yeah, if it's the same address, there'd be a lot of volume. Ah, yeah. So I should uh, clarify. Um, when you send it to the funds, you, the fund, I mean the, the slush pool, they're also going to uh, generate new addresses for every deposit. Otherwise, every single fund going into the mix is going to tie with all the other funds going out. Um, they don't want to be like clustered together. Right? So I should have uh, clarified that, but good point. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, Nick, Nick hit art. Um, basically, the mixer can steal funds, and you have to trust that it won't. There's also like a logging risk where you know this mixer could be just keeping track of like who uh, who it received the funds from and where it got sent to. And now the mix has, I mean, the mixer itself knows like the mapping from inputs to outputs. Um, and then there's also the fact that it's centralized. Uh, this means it's a single point of failure where, like, say the government, like, uh, they, they know, okay, here's this illegal mixing service. I'm going to hack into this service, and I'm going to install this uh, malware or this virus that's going to uh, just log it for me. And so I'm going to continue to let this uh, mix run and bust anyone who uses it. All right. uh, there's also some examples of some centralized mixing protocols called, like, a mixed coin or a blind coin. So mixed coin... Uh, they they are able to prove that okay this um, trusted third party uh, has stolen the funds and then it re relies on some kind of real world accountability uh, to make sure that this doesn't happen and then there's also blind coin so blind coin uh, removes the logging risk uh, because it it uses some cool cryptography to make it so that uh, when you send your funds in like uh, it doesn't know who the funds came from and who it's going to. Now, uh, there's also altcoin exchange mixing, which is basically, okay, uh, I'm just going to uh, take my Bitcoin that I want to anonymize and make private. I'm going to go to this one exchange, exchange it for like uh, Dash, go to another exchange, uh, exchange it for Zcash, and then like uh, while it's in Dash and Zcash, also use their inbuilt anonymity measures. And then finally, I'm going to go to like this last exchange uh, and then exchange my Zcash back to Bitcoin. Now, uh, altcoin exchange mixing uh, is, is decent uh, because, uh, one, on a qualitative level, it's hard for an adversary to de-anonymize you because they'd have to trace you through a lot of uh, disparate blockchains and exchanges if you're doing it right. Um, and there's also better plausible deniability because uh, as you're sending these funds around, this just looks like normal transaction history. It just looks like, oh, I'm just a normal user of this. Um, but you still have to kind of trust that these exchanges aren't somehow all colluding together to keep these uh, transaction mappings hidden. So you, you can imagine like, okay, if, if the government wants to crack down on altcoin exchange mixing, then they could require that all the exchanges uh, like have an open log that the government is able to uh, look. And then the government would now be able to see your transactions across all these different blockchains and like ruining all of this. But there's also some counterparty risk where, uh, as we know in this industry, it's always juicy and 
uh, exchanges get hacked all the time. So there's a small chance you'll lose your money uh, in transit. And then you're also going to lose transaction fees because you're uh, moving around a lot of different uh, nodes and exchanges. Yeah. Okay, so for next time, uh, we'll be covering the technical part. A uh, quick note on the readings. So uh, we have about Monero, which is an anonymous cryptocurrency using uh, something called ring signatures to prove that you're spending from a particular set of outputs but not revealing which output it is. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, but I, I think one of the, the most interesting readings is this uh, cypherpunk desert bus. Like uh, my, So there's this uh, developer called Peter Todd who participated in uh, the trusted setup of Zcash because they needed to basically securely <laughs> generate a random number and like discard it. Otherwise you can literally just like print money. So he, he goes, he details like all the super paranoid things he did, like uh, he like used cash to buy a used, uh, uh, like used rental car, drove to like Vancouver, uh, covered his phone with like tin foil, um, like air gapped his machine, and then like afterwards like burnt the RAM. Like uh, it, was, it was just ridiculous. Like uh, it, it's like sometimes we call this security theater and this would just be like a really interesting uh, like a thought exercise to see like this is, is this is what happens when you take security and paranoia to the utmost extreme um, otherwise I'll see you next week thank you guys All right.